Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today I'm talking pictures uh, with David Burnett. David is a, the closest thing to a household name. He just took over our screen real quickly uh, that you get in the photography world. If your name isn't Annie Leibowitz, the next best name is David Burnett if you want to be a household name. I, uh, I've been doing this photography thing for about 40 years now. And wow. early, early on, <laughs> There's David. Early on, I uh, when I started looking at bylines, uh, David Burnett's name was the first name I learned and was the first byline I, 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 I looked for every week in time or, or just wherever. Uh, whenever I was picking up a magazine, his work was everywhere. Uh, so he was an inspiration for me, and I'm, I suspect a lot of other people uh, from the very start. Uh, we started working together not too long after that, and he became a, a in the in the in the flesh mentor for me, and uh, once again to many others. He's the founder, one of the co-founders of Contact Press Images, and he is uh, he's a legend. David, how you doing? Well, <laughs> the fact that I've been doing this for fifty years doesn't really make me feel. Old that old but the fact that you've been doing it for 40 years makes me feel ancient <laughs> yeah yeah it's kind of surprising even when i say it it blows by i mean it blows by in a hurry that's all i can say i mean i i, I mean i can remember meeting you up at the main workshops i want to say about 78 or maybe 80 or something i don't know what year that was but i think it was 82 I'm guessing, though. Yeah. And Pledge and I were saying, boy, that guy really can shoot a picture. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and the funny thing is, I always tell people, and I, do, and I don't do that many workshops, but the first thing I say is, you're not going to take a good picture this week. Don't, don't get all upset about it. Nobody's ever taken a good picture at a workshop. But if you've had a good workshop, some little uh, bit of sort of microbial information will work its way into your head. And at some point, a week or a month or three months later, they'll be, you're in a, be in a situation, there'll be this little blossoming of understanding about something that all of a sudden makes sense that maybe didn't for those weeks or months after the workshop. Workshops are not a place to go and get your portfolio done. Workshops are a place to try and think about it. And the fact is, you actually shot a few good pictures that week. That was highly irregular. And, uh, <laughs> and off we go. Well, the, the thing I remember most about that workshop is the week before, I had taken a workshop with Gio Perez. And at that point, it was Gilly Paris to me. I didn't know how to say his name. I just kind of knew his photography. And I wanted, so I, I needed a workshop before the contact workshop and, and, and Gilly uh, filled the bill. So I went from Gilles to uh, the contact uh, frame of mind. And if anybody's been paying attention over that sport, that's quite a, that's a quite a mind blowing experience for, for a young lad from South Omaha. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Uh, I mean, I'm still sort of that combination of blessed and traumatized by the Syracuse Color Workshop that I attended in New York in 1969. I mean, that's 50 years ago. It was the summer. It was actually right before um, Apollo, right before Apollo 11. And I came to New York and I stayed at my cousin Bambi's apartment on about a block from where I live now on Second Avenue. And it was at the Syracuse building that, you know, these, all the Eastern schools had a big building in the city, you know, the Yale club, the Harvard club, and this was Syracuse. And they ran a color workshop, which was a big deal because in those days, everything was still black and white, but the teachers were, Bruce Dale, who was then all of about 30 years old from National oh. Geographic, George Silk from Life, Phil Harrington from Look, 
Eric Hartman from Magnum. Uh, there might have been one other, but these were like heavy duty people. And I, the last night as we showed our pictures and I had had a, as usual, a not very creative or very uh, successful week of shooting. And my pictures were up on the, on the screen for a minute and then there's silence. And the person on the, the button says, any more comments? And I can still hear his New Zealand voice rumbling through that might as well have been empty room, but George Silk managed to take the word no and get about four syllables out of it. It was like, anyway, you know, any more comments? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, that was the end of my life as a photographer. And then somehow I got reborn shortly thereafter. But so that, I think we've all gone through something like that. Everybody has to get some place where you get beaten down with a with a Philly club, and then you kind of, and then if you're, you know, if you bounce back, then you were meant to bounce back, and if you don't, then you were meant to go into business or own a car wash or invent new meals at restaurants. But I think every photographer has had some major beat down moment. Uh, from which you kind of have to spring back. So that's, I, did, did you have a fallback plan if the photography thing didn't work out? It did not really at that point. I had wanted to be an engineer. Originally in college, I was part of the Sputnik generation. You know, that Sputnik was my, I think fifth grade and sixth grade were really into it. And, you know, sixth grade, when you go to the barber shop and they've launched Sputnik 2 with Like of the Dog in it. And you're getting your hair cut and this guy's got his very sharp scissors and razors and stuff. And some old guy from the name, some old guy, some like 48 year old guy from the neighborhood is kind of wanders in there. So, well, if they can put up Putnik, they can sure send a rocket over here. It's like, you know, you're like a 13, 14 year old kid thinking, okay, my life is about to end. The Russians are gonna send all those missiles over here. So I really was kind of, at least for a couple of years, really into wanting to be building. And especially after Kennedy did the challenge to go to the moon, that would be a couple of years later, but we were in advanced math classes. I was gonna be an engineer. And then I ended up on the yearbook staff junior year of high school and that just turned everything from math. I stayed on math. I went to college. I was a math major. Freshman year I was, I'd already done the calculus that we were doing. I'd already done that in high school. Sophomore year we got into advanced calc and I had a calculus professor who mumbled. And that just made me realize that I couldn't stay with it and I moved over to political science. But by then, by even by sophomore year, I'd worked for a little weekly paper in Salt Lake City. I had interest in selling, you know, I was selling pictures to the uh, Friday night to the Salt Lake Tribune of a basketball game and getting my five bucks when they run one. And I was pretty really into it. And by junior, I think by junior year, when I got my Time Magazine internship, which they didn't call it that, you know, it was nothing Internship kind of implies we're going to check you out, and then if we really like you, we'll invite you back. I just had like a summer job with Time Magazine, taking pictures when I was 20 years old. I was too young to go get a martini at lunch with all the Washington photographers. And it probably was a good thing, because I would have just gotten like, you know, they, they'd come back after three martinis, and it's like, uh, you guys have lunch? And it was like, well, I guess if you count the olives, we did. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, that was the end of that generation. And I guess I was kind of in the next generation of, of folks who were not quite into, uh, you know, that three martini lunch the same way. I mean, later on, I started to see how it really took a toll on some of these guys, but that was their life. That was that kind of madman 50s, into the early 60s world and um, you know guys would go out and drink that's what guys did what, maybe, uh, so that was you were 20 with that 
that summer job with time. Right. Uh, what year was that? 60? That was 1967. I, 67. I, my 21st birthday was after I got back to college in September of 67. Uh, I had 11 pictures published in the magazine that summer. And it was like a pretty good deal. And when I got out of college in 68, I was kind of planning on uh, doing this European trip since that's what everybody did in those days. I had a few bucks saved up. And, um, and I remember the time editor saying, oh God, I, we thought you had one more year of school. We wanted you to come back for another summer. And I said, well, I'm planning to go to Europe for the summer. And I hadn't, I had never phoned him once. Uh, we'd have, those days you'd still communicated by letters. I mean, it's amazing. I wrote a letter and they wrote me a letter. And, and then I saw him on my way through New York on the way to Europe. But when I came back, they offered me a deal with, uh, I think it was one or two days a week assignment uh, guaranteed which basically was enough to have an apartment in, in Washington. And it always ended up being more than that. Where it got really juicy is when I found out that the $125 day rate could be obviated by doing two like headshots or portraits. And those were each half days at 75 bucks each. So instead of 125, you're book on 150. So now you're talking real money. And you know, if you did that a couple of days a week, you made two, 300 bucks. In 1968, that was pretty good dough for a photographer. I mean, a Nikon F was $220 for a body. The lenses, when I got to Vietnam, um, I got a really good deal through one of the Japanese Life Magazine photographers for 500 bucks. I got a black Nikon F, a 182.8, a 28 F2 and a 500 F8 mirror, all for 500 bucks. And I mean, I know I got a good deal on it, but he wasn't going to lose money on me. He just said, well, that's what it cost him, 500 bucks. So, you know, we have such a weird sense now of what things are worth and what they cost. And everything's gone up by five or 10 times in those, in those years. Um, but, you know, you still, you could get a, you know, if, if you've got a, a, a big roll, of like a 100-foot roll of Tri-X, it would be like 35 cents a roll to reload your own, a penny a frame. That was a deal. Yeah, you can't beat that. And so then you, so you went to, so you basically had a contract with time from the, from the very start. It wasn't a big contract, but it was, it counts. I did, and I had, uh, and I'd been in Washington through the fall of 68, through the Nixon inaugural, and into March of 69, at which point, uh, what I hadn't realized is that all these little assignments I was getting in Washington was taking work away from that group of freelancers for whom the, the Time Magazine deal was kind of a regular part of their rice bowl. and. Uh, some of them said something to the to Charlie Jackson, and he just kind of figured out a place to send me that I'd get out of their way, but I'd still be in, uh, able to work for the magazine. And he asked me if I wanted to go to Miami, and I said I did. So I packed up all my stuff, and I got rid of my apartment, and drove to Miami, and arriving the day that Dwight Eisenhower died. And I ended up staying for about a year and a half. And it wasn't, the, the unfortunate thing was they never bothered to tell the Miami girl I was coming. So I kind of went down and knocked on the door. So, hi, I'm your new photographer. And they were kind of, uh, yeah, who are you? So that one taught me that you always want to have somebody send a note out ahead of you're actually arriving somewhere. So was uh, good Diedrich was the bureau chief at that point or? Well, Joe Kane was the bureau chief, and unfortunately, he wanted to get out of Miami. So after I'd been there six or eight months, he left, moved to uh, Atlanta, where he ended up later kind of jumping on the Jimmy Carter bandwagon. They did that whole cover story on Carter as the face right. of the South and eventually leading to Carter's presidential uh, 
so I just I just want to step in here because there's people watching that probably don't realize that at one point time probably had a dozen or 15 bureaus around the US alone yep well there was Boston DC let's go down the coast Boston there even there was even a New York bureau New York DC uh, Miami, Atlanta, Chicago, Detroit, because automobile business was a big deal. Uh, somewhere in Texas, probably the Houston Bureau, Denver, San Francisco, LA, um, that's probably about, yeah, I mean, there's probably a couple we left out, but it was like a dozen bureaus plus Paris, London, and Rome. Madrid, Hong Kong, uh, Ankara, Istanbul. Well, tell me what that, Moscow. tell me what it was like to land. Well, that was before Narita, but you land in Tokyo. You had, um, you basically, you had a bureau there, but you had people that could help you do whatever you wanted to do. There was a Japanese uh, guy that worked in the Time Life Bureau. And in those days you had, it was both time and life. So you had the life guys were the picture people and the time people were mainly the kind of the word people. But you had, both of them were, you know, they usually be in one big space with a bunch of little cubbies for offices. Imai-san was, I don't even ever know his whole name, but Imai-san was how we all knew him. And, uh, you know, he his mission was to take take care of photographers, whether they be Ralph Crane or Ralph Morse or me. And me, I wanted to buy, on my way to, to Vietnam, I stopped in Tokyo for a few days. And he took me over to, oh, I forget the name of the camera, Matsushima Camera Store. And I got four Nikkor mats for about 80 bucks each and a bunch of lenses just so that I had everything I need. I think I probably spent 500 bucks for a whole bag of gear. And that were pretty much the cameras that got me through two years in Vietnam. And, um, you know, it, it, I, I would stay in Vietnam for about a year and a half. I got sick uh, with malaria during the India-Pakistan War in December of 1971, and I came home for a month. And I went back, and on the way back, I stopped in Tokyo again and had lunch with Imai san. And we had this incredible conversation, which only began years later to make sense to me. But he said, You know, I got a phone call uh, from a former life photographer who's working here in Japan and was looking for an assistant, William Eugene Smith. <laughs> And um, and I thought, God, I, Gene Smith, I would, I could just like take an extra month there and go work for him for a month. That wouldn't that be cool? He was doing Minimata. Yeah. The, and and then in my said something like, Well, he's not on staff anymore, so the heck with it. Right, right, <laughs> right. Like, and nobody at the time knew that that was going to become one of the. I mean, I'm looking at it right now on my bookshelf. Sure. But no one knew at the time that this was going to become this incredible story and full of pictures which lived for generations. But I just like, wow, well, yeah, okay, I got to get back to Vietnam. And I got back, and a few days after I got back, uh, you know, all hell broke loose. So, um, but it was it was one of those things where you had this whole bureau structure around the world, whether it was. Hong Kong or Bangkok. I mean, the Time Life bureaus were everywhere, South Africa, the Middle East. And somebody like me who was lucky enough to be working for Time Magazine and occasionally for Life, it was, it was a great support system. And unlike any, you know, nothing like that exists right now, I'm pretty sure. Maybe for the New York Times and Reuters or, you know, a couple of the AP. But it, associated with, but it's not something that you see at the magazine world anymore. Those days are gone. No, but to but to be even the 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 smallest 
the smallest fish in that pond. You had access to all those resources. Right. You had the the time life hotel to stay at. You had the time life drivers. You had the the guy who would take your film to the airport. You had all these things that uh, you had a translator, driver, whatever you needed. It was available. On my first R and R from Vietnam, I was I went to Hong Kong. And I'd been there. I was there three four days, and I. Went, on a, on a, I think a Thursday, I went to see John Sarr, who was the life reporter in that show. And, and I, I'd worked with him in, in Vietnam a little bit. And we were, uh, we were going to go have lunch. And on the way out of the office, he said to Loretta, the secretary, well, I don't suppose we'll hear from the Chinese. But if we do, just make sure that Frank, uh, Frank Fishbeck, a German-born photographer who was living in Hong Kong, just make sure that Frank is ready to go. And we go and we have this lunch and I say, well, what's up? So, oh, well, they're, they're having a, the American, um, uh, the American ping pong team is going to China. And you know, we applied to get a visa in 1971. Nobody was getting into China pretty much other than right. maybe Mark Ribu. And we had this lunch went back and I don't know, I went off with some other friends that night. The next morning I picked up the newspaper and there's a picture of Frank Fishback and John Sarr on the train that evening. They had gotten back from lunch. They'd been given the visas and off they went with the, the um, ping pong team. And it was the breakthrough of ping pong diplomacy, which, you know, uh, either you can see probably documentaries about it or you could watch Forrest Gump and it would pretty much explain <laughs> exactly what happened but that was the deal that was that trip and I thought god I would have been probably the next guy he would have thought of if Frank had been busy but not to be you know so you might have uh, I mean with the Gene Smith with the Minamata thing you might have really dodged a bullet there we don't know you could have went into that rabbit hole you know you, you didn't know how that was going to go no and you didn't know I mean he was never was he described by anybody that knew him? I don't think I ever met him, but never, no one ever described him as an easy guy to work with and be with or, you know, be responsible to. So I don't know that I would have, you know, taken, you know, that it would have been such a great thing. But you think like a guy like Gene Smith, who is revered for his work and his commitment and everything. It, now, even if you'd been yelled at 20 hours a day, you probably would have emerged from it a tougher, better photographer. You never know. I, and, you know, I'm pretty bad at yelling at people, so I'm not very good at trying to fulfill that role in the modern era. So at, at some point during this time, you got, uh, you got kind of a career boost uh, from Life magazine. How'd that, how'd that happen? Well, I'd been doing some shooting for time and uh, you know there was this terrible um, moment at the beginning of the invasion of Laos when the US was trying not to use so much use American forces but to aid the South Vietnamese in boosting the South Vietnamese chance of victories in the war and there was a big invasion in Laos to try and cut off supplies coming from North Vietnam down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was basically just a series of trails in the, in the Laos and jungles. And a number on the first day, nobody was allowed in. And then they finally decided after a couple of days, they would let one group of photographers in to do some pictures. And on this very fateful helicopter were Larry Burroughs from Life, Kent Potter from UPI, uh, Tezabura Shimoto from Newsweek, and Henri Huet from the Associated Press. And, you know, I was there with a bunch of other people. I got there late. We were all trying to get on that helicopter. Nobody wanted to be the last one to get into Laos. It was kind of, that was the big story. And, you know, the helicopter went away. And like an hour later, we found out it had been shot down. And it was literally decades before anything was ever recovered from the helicopter. Finally, in, that was 1971, in about 1990s, Christy Pyle and 
Horace Foss from the Associated Press, who had been absolutely um, unstinting in their desire to try and find out what happened there. They had gone in with a recovery, one of the American Army recovery crews, and they found a few bits of, of one of Larry's, Larry Burroughs' Leica cameras. And all of the, the stuff that they found was buried in an urn at the museum in Washington, D.C. in 2008 in this hall that's been dedicated to the passing of news photographers around the world, and which is a way too many people, way, way too many people on that, their names are on that list. Anyway, um, after, after Larry passed away, life was, uh, they had asked Mark Godfrey, who had been the other life photographer working in Vietnam, if he'd moved to Hong Kong and I started to do a few little stories in Vietnam. And then I stayed through the whole of, of uh, the rest of 71 and into 1972. And uh, it was there almost two years. And then I came back. At that point, I had a life contract. I was going to be coming back in the end of 72 and resettling in Chicago. They were going to give me the Chicago Bureau, which would have been a great, great deal for Life Magazine when you were still doing something. Every week you'd be in the magazine. And I got back in October and uh, spent the next month in New York. Uh, was getting ready to go off on my first cover story on Don Shula and the unbeat Miami Dolphins, the NFL. And the night of my going away party, because I was just going to head to Chicago and find a place to live. The night of my going away party, one of my friends from uh, another life photographer came to the party and he said, by the way, you're not going anywhere. They're going to close the magazine tomorrow. So what are you talking about? Yeah, they're closing the magazine. It's, it's, not, it's losing too much money. They can't handle it anymore. So that was the deal. The next day, Life Magazine was announced immediately they would cease publication. And there's actually one, one of the great moments, the, the great untold moments in journalism, took place that day in the photographer's lounge because one by one, the, the word had gone out, everybody should be at this meeting at 11.30 or whatever, and a bunch of the people kept coming in. There was Alfred Eisenstadt, all these names that you knew, and I, I had gotten to know some of them. Carl Maidans, who by then was probably in his 70s, maybe even in his 80s, was getting ready to head to Singapore. He was gonna move back to Singapore. He, among other things, been captured by the Japanese in World War II, made the picture of MacArthur coming ashore when MacArthur said, I shall return. And Carl is over in the corner of this little photographer's office on a paper trimmer, just kind of trimming up tear sheets that he's taping in to a scrapbook. And in came uh, Corinne Meester, uh, formerly the Dutch rowing, Olympic rowing team, 1960, I think, and big, big sort of tough, strong guy. And, and he's kind of like, well, what's going on here? And, and John Olson, my friend, uh, who could see the writing on the wall, he said, well, Co, they're, they're going to close the magazine. And Meanwhile, over in the corner, Carl Maidan's this little elfin character is trimming up his parachutes. And Poe's like, well, no, they'll never close the magazine. Maybe they go monthly or something. And, and John is like, no, Coe, they're going to close the magazine. So, no, no, it's not possible. They never, they can never close the magazine. And they kind of go on like this back and forth. And finally, Olsen says, um, Coe, I'll bet you $1,000 at 10 to 1 odds that they're going to close the magazine. And Carl Maidans just halts from his trimming for one second and just turns around and says, I wouldn't take that bet if I were you, Co. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it was the perfect little moment on an otherwise pretty awful day. So yeah, not Life Magazine closed. Uh, that, was, that was what I had hoped my whole life would be built around, was being a, a Life Magazine photographer. And um, 
So how old are you? You're like 24, 26. 26. And, and um, so you'd landed at life. You had, you know, you were on the gravy train with biscuit wheels. You were riding it. Well, I had a, and I had a contract already kind of signed for the next year, guaranteeing me a thousand bucks a month, which again, I, I mean, I think I got an apartment in Chelsea uh, in February or March. And it was 265 a month. So I, you could kind of live on a thousand. You just couldn't live fancy or buy a lot of gear, but I, I had a way of starting. And I ended up, um, I got one of those passed along Pan American Airways tickets. My friend uh, Dirk Halstead, who had friends in the Pan Am PR office. Um, they would give when they do a new uh, a new trip. They would inaugurate like Miami to Belém, Brazil, and they take a bunch of press people. And Dirk always got invited to go on one of these trips and just take a few pictures and make make a little story somewhere. So he couldn't do it. So he asked me if I wanted to go, and I ended up going to Brazil and I spent six weeks shooting in Brazil. And for me, it was like this cathartic thing, getting better from the the total blowout of, of Life Magazine uh, closing. And when I came back from there, uh, would have been about April or May, I, I got a call from uh, Gamma in Paris. The, so Gamma, Gamma is a, Gamma, a French Gamma photo was the French photo agency, one of the, really the first of the French photo agencies who started in 1967. And in 19... 73, a bunch of them, they had a big disagreement about how they wanted to run and a bunch of them left and formed Sigma. And, uh, and I had a couple of friends who were on the, the Gamma side and they called me and they said, hey, do you want to work for Gamma in the US? And I said, yeah, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. And it ended up being a great deal. And I stayed with Gamma for two years it was still in the world in the world before all the digital stuff. You're still shooting film. Film's got to get processed. Prints have got to get made. Slides have got to get developed. Uh, you got to write captions on the slides and the prints. Get them out to agents in all these different countries. And the idea was that if it was a good story and worth doing, the work that you did would eventually sell somewhere and preferably multiple places. Um, I mean, the bottom line was you would always get at least one picture page in the Kuwait Daily News because they used everything we sent them. And you get a picture page in the Kuwait Daily News. Well, I mean, it was probably worth about 20 bucks, but at least it looked good. And meanwhile, it was, you know, carry match on something that was important, carry match. I started doing a few things again for Time Magazine. And... Uh, I would say in those two years for, for Gamma, I probably was able to do things around the world in a way that I never would have done if I'd been working for Life Magazine. So I had no complaints about it. And then finally, after I started, I was kind of unhappy with the way they were treating some of the material in Paris. And that's when Bob Pledge and I decided to start our own agency contact, which we so did in let me just say. Let me just get into the uh, the whole agency model. I don't know why this isn't switching back. Okay, so Magnum was kind of the first. It was a co-op. It was an agent. Right. Uh, Gamma came along. Gamma begot Sigma. Sigma after that, it kind of the doors, the floodgates were opened. At the, I mean, there was there was Black Star was in the U.S. Well, Black Star had been around since World War II, or maybe. Right. Even it came out there, were, there were more stock agencies like Hicks and these other places, but the, the journalism agencies, uh, Black Star was probably the major American one. And then you had uh, Gamma, Sigma, SIPA um, in France. And France was kind of the hub of all that. Working on speculation, you go out and you do the project with the hopes and the understanding that you would probably get enough money back from what you sold, that would be, um, you know, you would have a 
positive cash flow, shall we say. So that was 180 degrees uh, different than the, uh, and the, the time, the, the life model that you were, the eight, t tell me about the philosophy, the agencies, how, how, how we'd work, how we, how we, uh, how we survive. Well, because everybody thought, everybody thought, remember that when life closed, that was the first time that photojournalism died, you know, that was it. Right. And that's we all we all thought it. But in fact, Time and Newsweek and even U.S. News, the weeklies, it was important that it become a weekly thing. Once you got into the monthlies, their, their schedules were such that it was kind of removed from the news. The weeklies were still plugged into the news and what was happening on a daily basis. And so you had, uh, you know, Time had the deepest pockets probably. Newsweek was always trying to do figure out how to do the same job, but with less money. And then U.S. News was a little more particular in what they decided to go for, but they would also produce some pretty interesting work from time to time. For the photographers, it was a chance to, um, you know, if that's what you wanted to do, if you wanted to do the news and what was happening in the world, uh, in this country, that was pretty much it. In Europe, you had, I mean, uh, I can't even think of, you know, the UK was probably more daily newspapers, and France and Italy and Germany it was more the weeklies, Stern, Epoca, Perry Match, uh, and then in France you had other magazines like L'Express and uh, Jeune Afrique. I mean, the the money wasn't always big, but if you had enough different places going at a time, you could uh, you could make a living at it, and you could still end up covering the kind of things you wanted to cover, the big stories or the little stories, or whatever your taste was. So so you were you didn't have, you know, the the access to this time life machine. You still had it a little bit with time, but yeah. you, you had something a lot better. You had I mean the world was really even though you weren't getting uh, assignments, first class travel and all that kind of stuff, at that point that's when the world kind of became your oyster. No, and the thing is, what you discovered is even though uh, there were, you know, there was certainly life and time people who always traveled first class stuff, I learned how to find, find the cheapest rent a car, find the cheapest rental. I mean, I was able to, I became really good at shopping around and being able to get this stuff done uh, with, with much less money being spent up front to produce it. And, uh, you know, finding, uh, getting on with a local TV guy to get a ride in their helicopter for some story. I mean, it was, you had to scrounge more, but I don't think the scrounging necessarily put you at a disadvantage. That kind of uh, inventiveness probably helped uh, sharpen what you were trying to do in terms of how you would, uh, how you could get your, you know, access to a story. I mean, it's very, it's very French. Contact, you know, it might be an American agency per se, but it's everything right. about it's totally French. We were it's doing everything model. French. Yes. yes. And I think, you know, uh, we would try and get assignments or very often on the really interesting stories, you would get assignments after the fact. You go out, you do it, and then you come back with this, the goods, and they would negotiate what the equivalent would have been if you had been on assignment. And then you always could try and uh, you know, ration it up a little bit because you had the goods already. And once you had the pictures, that puts you in a much better place for, um, for negotiating. So tell me about like the first year of contact in New York City. So 1976, uh, I had been going back and forth to Korea and Japan the previous, in 75, after the fall of Vietnam, I went to Korea for six weeks and did a big story, kind of based on the theory that if there is a domino theory, that Korea would be the next domino to fall. And it ended up being a, uh, you know, I went to Suzanne Ritchie, who was then a photo researcher, and I said, give me a box of color chrome, like 200 rolls of film, and I'll go do a great story for you. And we ended up uh, over that summer. I mean, I was there like six weeks. We had an interview with President Park Chung-hee. I had a uh, 
covers, you know, it was cover, and it was like the best thing was like we did an out, um, an outside interview in the garden where you had enough ambient noise that the sound of a Nikon camera was totally covered by the birds and the traffic and everything, and beautiful light. And when he died, uh, like four years later, when he was assassinated, I had the cover of both Time and Newsweek with those pictures. And didn't happen very often, but it did occasionally happen. So, and you know, you just you would try and latch onto a story that didn't. I just say you you if you wanted to go do a story because you thought it was interesting, you would just go do it on the assumption that if it worked out, you'd have something very saleable. And you know, it, it there were so many times when that was the case. Uh, and that in the, the 70s, which had started off with, you know, in 72 with the end of life magazine and photojournalism is dead. But then there were all these ways that it was kind of reborn in the photo agency world. And that, uh, you know, contact was this little agency, a couple of editors. It was not a big deal at all. But when we had a package, we could get enough money for it that it would kind of keep everything rolling. Well, we. It wasn't a big agency, but it it was it was definitely influ influential. I mean, it, it it was the the color photography agency that you know Magnum had kind of gone off the radar at that point. The uh, the ma the news magazines had just started to go to full color publications like I in the early '80s. I think 1978, Time Magazine finally figured that they could they moved their their whole back end up so that they could publish color from the same way. We were mostly shooting Kodachrome. Um, the whole idea of, the, of, of having our own agency was that we would take the additional time to try and really work a story rather than just go out and shoot for a day or two days, but to really invest the time in these long-term projects and that those would be the things that would, in the end, uh, you know, pay off in terms of what got used and how they got used and monetarily. And I think a lot, so much good work. I mean, look what Alan Reiniger went to South Africa and basically stayed for a couple of years and just kept producing you know, one good story after the next. And uh, the amount of stuff we, we did in those early years was pretty, pretty amazing. 